Right on cue live. We are live, and I got two guests here with me. Returning guests, both of them. <laughs> Introduce yourself first, and we'll get right into it. Um, Braille, known as YR for the infamous. You feel me? Shout out Philly, Uptown, currently in Cali. I do a little bit of everything. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm Jacob, and uh, I'm from North Philadelphia. All right, bet. So we actually, before you got here, bro, we started a little uh, brief conversation about just basically just money in a sense. Just right. how if people have different uh, perspectives and priorities with money and understand how some people might want to get back to money. Other people might want to be more sacrificial in a sense. And I feel whether it's the NBA thing or the economy crash and re niggas recognizing that they, a lot of, most entities are putting money above health I feel like money is a big, well, it's always a big topic. I feel the conversation around it has shifted into certain regards. And I also see a lot of terms being thrown around like black elitists and like people being against ant capitalism <laughs> and black people turning into white people and all that type of shit, whatever. So generally, what are y'all, some of y'all thoughts on those type of conversations and topics? Whoever want to go for it. Um, so I hear the-, the Are black you a black elitist? Are you uh, you against the cause? You against the cause? <laughs> um, man, uh, I like to take an approach of looking at history throughout time, and you can just remove the last six hundred years for Black folk and and imagine look at the history when we were in Africa, and you always had stratifications of different social economic uh, groups of people. Um, whether it was people who were considered royalty, people who were farmers, people who were slaves, uh, all these things. Uh, so, I mean, nothing is new under the sun, and I think that people tend to vote uh, their agenda. However, there's a time and a place for us to come together collectively uh, for the betterment of our people. I think my biggest issue is that uh, when it's not reciprocated, uh, amongst the groups. And what, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, like, for example, uh, let's see. I, I, use, I use community, for example. Like, I do a, I do a lot of community uh, involvement work, and a lot of the policies that we are expected to push only caters to a certain uh, demographic, social demographic. Uh, it's usually policies that uh, tend to benefit uh, lower income people, which is fine, uh, and middle income people, which is fine, but when it gets to the pockets and the small minorities of people who are maybe have above middle income and the things that they want to do and the things that they want to develop for black people who uh, subscribe or like certain things, it kind of gets minuscule, and which is unfair because, uh, you know, the, the people whose ideas get minuscule are still expected to show up. Uh, for everything so i think that you know we still have some work to, to do in terms of everybody taking everything into account so you feel like kind of like the people who i suppose on the bottom of the social economic ladder get a little more uh hearsay priority in regards yeah to i mean yeah which is expected because because Maybe of making health up health the majority right, right, right. uh but it's like we also have to be careful not to take away the voices of our own minorities because that is what we're pissed off about in America as, as minorities. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to continue the same actions that uh, we dislike, especially amongst ourselves. Fair. Well, any other general thoughts? It's going to be original question. Me, my whole, I just think, you know, like the whole black and this thing, I get it. I mean, and it's true. I mean, there are some people when they get to a certain status, they generally change who they are and how they treat people who are basically on the same level they once were, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know what people be wanting. You know, like people is like, they want the resources, the money, this and that. And then it's like, no, you're going to be elite if you get the money. And it's like, wh what do you want? You know what I mean? It's like, we want the power, we want the economic resources, but if we get it, then we're inherently evil for having it. Like, I don't really understand what's the thought process. Cause even with, like when Jay-Z said, um, regentrify the hood, like for black people, it's like, yeah. everybody knew what he meant, but 
They were like, Why oh, you just want to be an old white man. Yeah. It's like, no, he wants us to own our own things. Like, why are we trying? It's like every time someone says something, people try to twist it to make it evil, like inherently evil, but it's like, it's not. Like being rich, I guess people feel it's inherently evil because nobody gets to a certain uh, financial level without fucking somebody evil practices, yeah. right? At the same time though, I feel like if you do end up at a certain millionaire, multi-millionaire, if that person is gonna redistribute that and help the communities and do all these things, you know what I mean? Why would you not want that? Why wouldn't you want the, the wealth dynamic to shift over? I'd rather my people have those financial mm -hmm. just tyrants empowered and fucking Jeff Bezos who doesn't care about anything that we're gonna go through. Like I'd rather be whole, you know what I mean? Because people are not gonna, I don't care what anybody thinks, people are not gonna stop chasing this money. <laughs> and it's country gonna happen. Yeah. So you need to get you some, you need to get you some capital, you need to get you some assets, and you need to learn it. And I think another thing with the black elitists though, the thing that, that gives it like that, it's off-putting because I mean these people, like for instance, just a small friend pushing financial literacy on the people like when you keep pushing financial literacy, financial literacy, oh you're not financially literate. It's like okay, you could be financially literate, but I'm still poor. The only thing financial literacy could do for someone in poverty is help them not get poor. Like present opportunity with that. And then maybe the black elitists won't have such a negative non connotation on it. You know what I mean? So that's just my thoughts to that. I actually really like that point, that last point, because I agree, like, you know, me and you have had a conversation about uh, finance and stuff like that, whatever. And I know recently I've had um, a shift in perspective of, of the urgency of the financial literacy and, you know, um, finance and shit like that, whatever. But I definitely understand and recognize my privilege of my current stability where I'm able to move right. and do certain things, whatever. And it, just, it gave me the understanding of, like, no, finances and generating and diversifying your finances and portfolio shit like that whatever it isn't that hard as people may think we just aren't the information isn't regularly accessible to our demographics like that whatever but my main thing was like but once you're stable it's not hard to progress exactly. but, but, if you're not, but if you're not stable none of this should even matter you have to have something to mess with and work with Exactly. You, well, you from a survival standpoint, nigga, I, I'm fuck all this compound interest and for diversifying, nigga. I'm trying to eat today. So, yeah. You know, yeah, but that's the thing. People think that they're going to eat today. And it's like, I've gone to, I've gone to family members and said, hey, you always say that, you know, you come to me wanting to know how I do this, do that. But then when I let you know, you're not ready to cut your frivolous expenses and then, right. and then still be upset that you don't have, uh, cash flow coming in each month so it's like well what exactly do you want or do you just want to be miserable and then and then spread that miserableness to people who aren't so right. you know I, you know it's definitely nuanced and later because like once you know better you do better but of course it's hard for people to have that awakening moment if they have such a lot of bad patterns and tendencies yeah and everybody's just not gonna get it everybody not gonna it's not gonna resonate everybody not gonna get on mm -hmm. to it but it's like the context or why aren't they getting it? It's like they, if like, yeah. they, you know, so I think for a lot of people, they just, they just not there yet. It's like, for instance, I, me personally, I was like never dirt poor. It's like I was living in the hood, but I was never poor. Like my mom, my dad. Likewise. Likewise. I mean, so I'm in, in college, for instance, I really, I didn't want to call and ask yourself. So like I was on my own broke, you know what I mean? So what I did, I had financial literacy already. So what I did was I manipulated my credit. I was using my credit, but I was making small payments so it didn't completely destroy my score. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I had the financial literacy that if I had money at that moment, I could have made way more, but I didn't. So the only thing I could do was not become poor. So I don't think it's that a lot of people don't want to do it, it's that they don't even have the ability to try to build on the information that you're giving them. So I, I think a lot of people when bringing financial literacy to somebody, if you're gonna bring the lessons to them, bring the opportunity with it. Because if they don't have the foundation, anything you're telling them does not matter. And that's mm -hmm. what I think a lot of people are. And, and yeah. also I would say is a, a lot of time out of insecurity, you know, insecurity is a natural thing for everybody. 
And also, I feel was what comes natural and security, you project it. So I've heard, not, not personally from me, but I've heard from other people, not even about money, but also just regular conversation. You could tell someone something that is a fact, and that's the truth, but <laughs> the insecurity would like be like leap out, like, why are you trying to talk down to me? Like, no, I'm not trying to talk down. I'm trying to that's, tell you something you don't true. know. And you're not even trying to listen and catch it. You're just trying to act like I'm trying to be It's like, because you're teaching them, they feel like you think right. you're better than them. Right, I know, like, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, but also, Jake, back to your point of like trying to tell someone something, uh, like I said, uh, like like I was talking to Rel a while ago, you know, Reese, I got into stock show like that, whatever, you know, and studying in that fast or whatever. And I remember my man, like, you know, months ago when Disney was real low and it was below $100. And he was like, yo, he was telling people, like, yo, I think everybody should get on Disney right now, whatever's going to go up and all that shit, whatever. And one of his man, he got really frustrated with, dude was like, and it was like right when stimulus checks first went out, whatever. Yeah. And man got a stimulus check. Well, like, nah, I don't really got it because, you know, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to move. He was like, what you mean? You don't got it, though. Like, like you literally <laughs> do got it. Like, he's like, five yeah. shares, and you're going to be up eventually. Like, what? Hey, he's he like, could have nah. took 600. Right. He's like, yo, like, this and that. And I remember he told me about it. I'm like, no, I can understand. I don't know what his situation is. Like, he, if he's saying he's right. trying to move, he probably really needs money right now to do something. He's like, oh, mm -hmm. my, like, I'm not trying to hear that shit. Like, he like, he, and he said to me, I thought it was interesting. He said, People don't understand there's a difference between spending and investing. He's like, mm -hmm. it ain't like you but to buy some sneakers or whatever the fuck. This money can lead to more money, but he can't even wrap his mind around it. Cause I I, he, I can guarantee if it was something where I could tell him, yo, you can get money today. No, he, would, he will find some money to give to me right then and there. He's like, oh, you right. I can I can fix I can move this around and get it to you. But the fact that it's like a long term thing. A lot of people can't wrap their mind around that type of. Yeah, yeah. we're not has, familiar to. We're not familiar to that type of system and shit like that. Because I you think that has something to do. You think that has something to do with people who who live for the day and don't plan? Because I hear a lot of people saying that you know, they just live for the day and they don't really plan long term. Definitely a part of it in a lot of cases, I should say. I, was, I mean, I guess it's like when you say if you had fifteen hundred dollars here, man. Taking 750 of it and putting it somewhere and you don't really understand how it works that you're going to get your money back is like that risk. You probably feel like you cannot take that risk. Mm -hmm. Like me personally, I only been working, but well, this is my 11th month out of college working, right? So one day I was checking my account. I looked, I'm like, damn, like, where's my money at? Like, what did I buy? And then I remembered I bought hella stocks and stuff. Like, so my money wasn't gone. Right. It was somewhere else. So that made me think like, oh, this is this is like my savings. Like right. I, I created a savings that's grown. You yeah. know what I mean? But some people they can't they can't have that money missing and feel like and then check one day and it's down. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? And they gonna pull it out. And then they lost money. So it's like some people can't take that risk, and that's why they can't understand it. The risk is blinding them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But they're not understanding that. When you put that money somewhere, it's not gone. You can, you can take it back if you want. It's not gone. Mm -hmm. You just have to do it, though. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah, I mean? Jake, I'm, I'm going to ask yeah. you about, uh, kind of you into real estate and all that type of shit, but I'm going to ask you a little more specifically about what you get into. But um, I know uh, I, was, I was watching a video about stocks one time, and I'm going to ask you all a general question at the end of this, but they was talking about, like, I forgot who it, who it was. They said, but they suggest with people that get involved the stock market at certain times, they say, I don't suggest people try to like try to catch windows when something is low and catch a high, shit like that, whatever, because they won't be able to deal with a possible loss. Because if you new to something and you take that loss, is you'd be like, oh fuck this shit. I ain't coming back. It's a scam. This ain't mm -hmm. real. I could I lost a hundred dollars in one day I can do it. Because I would suggest people get into like safe bets like a Nike or whatever type of shit. Like, you know, it's not gonna come down for the most part. And at least you can see that return. You get more comfortable with that. All right, cool. All right, this is safe. And then, all right, let's yeah. diversify what our positions are, or whatever. Not that those into it, I can see someone just being like, well, I'm losing money. Oh, no, I, I can't. I can't even deal with this, whatever. Um, yeah. so, so, oh, so this is what the question is. Would y'all say you have $900 to your name? To your name. You log, you're trying to, get in, you're trying to invest some money. You lose $100. Wait, I'm going to think for a second. Yeah, so you have you have a thousand dollars to your name, you lose a hundred dollars. There we go. You lose a hundred dollars ten percent. Is that the same effect or whatever, same feeling as having a ten million dollars and then losing a million dollars? No. Are they equal or is one worse? <laughs> one is definitely worse. 
Which is worse? If you have a thousand and lose a hundred, it's worse. I agree with that. I agree. Where's I know it? because of the position I'm in now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I invest stocks. So, for instance, in college, if I lost a hundred dollars doing some shit, like I would have thought about that hundred dollars for months. Like, <laughs> like I could have did a lot with that hundred. But shit, early last month I put. I wasn't supposed to do this, but I broke one of my own rules. I put a thousand into some shit, like on an option, mm -hmm. and lost a thousand. <laughs> but I didn't panic because I got until like August or the end of July for it to go up to make my money. Right. But I lost a thousand dollars in two days. But I did. It, it doesn't even phase me no more. Like it, it's like I'm playing a game. It don't phase me no more because I feel like I'm gonna get it back. And that's how you feel. You got nine million dollars to build on. It's easier to make more money. Mm -hmm. But if you got a thousand and lose a hundred, you're fucking done. Like it hurt. <laughs> what do you think, Jake? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's just relative because because it's like it's ten percent. It's yeah. just ten percent of whatever it is that you're. Like, I've had some people tell me, "No, nigga, if I lose a million dollars, I don't care how much I had this million. I'm just like, I never had a million dollars." But I would think, me, my personality, I'd be like, like, Rail just are saying, like, was saying, I'm still good overall. But I'm going to continue to. So I know yeah, you're it's relative. relative. Yeah, yeah, it's relative because, I mean, granted, if, if at that $1,000 and you lose 100, if you still have like the same liabilities and it's proportional to if you were to scale it up, you have $10 million and you lose a million, if you're still in that comfortable space, uh, it's just 10%. It's ten percent relative to you, or relative to that moment in time. But it's still a million dollars. Like, don't get me wrong. But you, if you're investing big money, ten million dollars, and and you take a ten percent loss, it's a ten percent loss. Of course, you don't want to take no losses, but you know, ten percent. Um, Jake, are you um? Like I said, like I said, I know you're into real estate, and I, I will say also, like speaking of like when Ray was talking about people just not being ready to hear some of this and that, whatever. I know, of course, no, yeah, you're cool. We, you know, we have, uh, always have a good, good time speaking with whatever. But I know mm -hmm. that's one of the things I gravitated towards you, or wanted to talk to you on the show. Cause I've, I've heard you, I've seen you, and heard you speak about just being involved in certain finances and shit like that, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, that's somebody I need to know. That's somebody I need to hear more from, whatever. Cause I know that's why I started being in certain positions. That was mm -hmm. fucking three years ago now, whatever. But I feel, and even though it's always been my direction, I feel only just now is when I finally got to a certain level of discipline and mm -hmm. focus be really doing and moving certain things whatever um so i think i did i, I think time and it's interesting for certain people and even certain people of course just don't want to hear it at all not ready to hear it. and other people they can be ready to hear it but still not right per se yeah. so are you someone that's um involved in that regard with your finances and stocks or how do you deal with certain things or what do you uh do uh so like my assets are diversified mm -hmm. uh Right now, it's largely concentrated. And also, and also as you uh, answer, mm -hmm. had that changed over time? Did you have to learn certain things along the way? All those things. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 changed over time because before I invested in real estate, most of like whatever I had was in stocks, mm. and uh, but I knew that the natural progression for me would be real estate, just because uh, the real estate market properties grow at a value of like. In Philly, it was like 17 to 25 percent. Meanwhile, the stock market grew, grew, grew on average of like seven to nine. Mm -hmm. uh, so the return on interest was, you know, investment was much better with the uh, stock market. But I learned a lot of trial and error, uh, not so much with the process of acquiring uh, the property, uh, but dealing with tenants and management and uh, making sure that things were up to code and you got to have your documents ready. Some things I'm still working on and trying to perfect. Mm. Um, yeah, that answers the question. Is that, um, was, uh, I, to my knowledge, like your dad, is that, is that in a sense he kind of put you on or gave you a knowledge or the game in a sense, or and you kind of took it and ran with it? Or like, how did you actually get introduced to this no. level yeah, of investing I, or finance? Definitely got the game from my pop. Um, got the game from my pop and mom, and and kind of perfected. I built on what they taught me. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I had access to some of their capital uh, to get a head start and do certain things. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, it's like a risk because I could have I could have messed up and it's been, up been every day, yeah, all the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but one thing I did make sure is that I you know studied to show myself approved. I made sure that I looked at the market and I did this for years. I was you know looking at um, you know what areas are going to develop and where is the state money going to? Where is the city money going to? What is the policy saying? And kind of putting all the pieces together and just trying to make a strategic decision. And um, after I did my got did my first property, I was like, okay, I think and, I got the feel of it. And, and what was like your first property? Like, uh, what kind of property was it? Uh, it was the duplex. Cool, cool. It, it, was, it, was, it was a duplex. Yeah, did you live in it as well? Did you live in it? Yeah, I lived in I lived in I, I, I lived in the first apartment uh, for three years. So I did my three year bid and then moved out. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, yeah, I agree, bro. That's that's, that's my first year too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like get a duplex first. That's crazy because like that's the the way like what he just said was like so perfect. I'm like, damn, maybe I'm doing something right because like I'm yeah. brand new to life essentially. Like, I'm just mm-hmm. able to so it's like me that's why i do stock i feel like i ain't have enough capital to go into real estate so i've been building my capital through the stock market mm-hmm. and like that's how i've been getting more money essentially so it's like i plan on moving into real estate though mm-hmm. and i've been thinking like i probably want to do I would, like did you buy your first property like in philly where you live or did you look at other markets out of state to be like i could afford this out of state and develop it there or yeah, I, I looked at I looked at Philadelphia, uh, and I looked I looked in an area that I had some familiarity with, um, and something that was you know just close to where my support systems were. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know the city council for the area uh, has ties with the community. Um, you know, certain programs that were running in the community. Uh, and just just proximity to what I was already doing and had going on. And also, you, know? you own that same first property. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, dope. All right. Yeah. And and Rob, I mean, it still it still has a mortgage on it. Don't get me wrong, but but yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. I was, yeah, of course. Um, mm-hmm. bro, so like you said, so speak more on your story. Cause I I find your whole path very interesting because which I didn't mm-hmm. know about it when I as as well when I first met you. I knew you in school and stuff. But I find your current position very intriguing and just dope and just uh, inspiring for just people to know whatever. Cause I know what well, I'll let you speak on it. <laughs> so, like I said before, I came up in Philly. You know, my mom, my dad, um, they both work in the hospital. My dad, he started out as like a, um, his dad got him a janitorial job. He was a custodian at Everton Hospital. Eventually, he went to school. He became an LPN, then an army. Mm-hmm. Right now, he runs the floor at um. Edmonton as the head nurse of that whole sector. So like he built up to that. that was, that's what he built. You know, my mom, same thing. She um she went to school while they was together, went back. She's LPN now, so she does that. Um, me, my brothers, we all just always went to school. I always been, I always had like um, people expected a lot of me because I was smart. So I went to a lot of different schools, starting in public school. My teachers wanted me to go to charter, ended up doing that, and the charter said go to campus. So I did the same thing for high school up until then. My background is like, we was never poor, but I mean, we had the most, but me, I just was always building my knowledge, no matter what, and I didn't. So this is the thing about two, I, this whole financial literacy thing. So me, I only probably worked two jobs in my life, but it's not because I was getting stuff from my mom or my dad's cause I always assessed my talent and abilities and how can I make them profitable. And know that's what I used as my jobs. I did graphics, I did music, I did whatever I could, I did clothes, like I did whatever I could learn and I sold it. You know what I mean? So that's what I built on. Even in school, that's what I was doing. Um, I decided my career path real early. When I was in sixth grade, I decided I want to be an electrical engineer. Um, and about from second to fifth, I just knew I wanted to build stuff. I wanted to know how stuff worked. I was that type of kid. I wanted to see like, damn, how the cops pulling us over? How they know we speeding? That's how I learned about a speed gun. Mm-hmm. That's crazy that that's how I had to learn about that, but it's like a cop pulling us mm-hmm. over. But it's like, that's why I'm like, how, how can you possibly know? And like, that's how I learned it. So like, I did that with everything. And that's how I decided to become an engineer. So coming out of school, you know, 
in high school, I always was interested in owning things and having assets. I mean, I come from nothing. We don't own nothing. I never I knew many people that own stuff, and the ones I do, they got it like they like they really had it. So I mean, I wanted to know how could I put myself in that position. I mean, my dad, my mom, of course, they give you they gave me a little game, you know, like credit. I always take care of your credit, save. Just the basic stuff, but I really took it to that next level, figuring out, you know, like best in stocks. I took my circle and stuff. I learn fast too, so that helps. Like I'm a quick learner, so I pick stuff up. Somebody tell me something once, I'm gonna know it the rest of my life. You know, I'm not gonna forget that. So I just built on a lot of stuff going from high school to college. I I research, research, research. And then now I got a job with a Fortune 500 company. I work in the space industry. And so I finally have the means to build on it. This is things I've been telling people since I was 18, like, yo, I'm gonna do this. Like I will see people in a position to do what I want to do now and tell them like, yo, make this move. Mm -hmm. but because I couldn't do it, they didn't believe mm -hmm. I knew what I was talking about. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now that I'm in that position and I'm doing it, everybody, so many people approach me like, oh, put me on this, put me on this, put me on game. And it's like, I was been trying to put y'all on game. And y'all could have put me on game. Y'all could have been further. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's where I'm at right now. And that's how I got to where I am right now. And so I'm still on that whole thing. I want capital, I want assets, and I want to leave a legacy and something for my family, you know? And the younger generation, like me and my brothers, like our little cousins, we, we motivate them like to the max. My brother, Harlem Goldtron, I'm a rapper and a rocket scientist. My little brother wants me to college. They see that and they like, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like, that's, that's how I want to make it. Make sure they know they can do anything. And y'all got to be in the streets. Y'all got to rap. Y'all got to shoot a hoop to be the one balling in the bench. You feel me? So mm -hmm. that's why I'm in it. Yeah, dude. And that's one thing I um I noticed, like I said, back I just didn't know as much the details about it, but I, like, one thing I've always noticed about creators, well, like creators in general, especially rappers, they tend to try to hire how they make money in a sense, whatever. But you never hear the fact that you was in school, you was an engineer, you work a tourist something, whatever. So one, is the first question is like, like, is the ultimate goal, or of course, the ultimate goal, I suppose, is like just being financially free and up, whatever. But is it more so to work that way or to actually be a rapper and kind of leave this by the wayside in a sense? So, all right, so I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to make it in rap because I always thought that my one true dream was to just be a famous artist. You feel me? I want to be a famous artist and then. As I got older, I realized it wasn't really that I wanted to be a famous artist. I just wanted to have what they had. I wanted to have a means. I enjoy making music. I enjoy creating. But at the end of the day, what I wanted was the means to do it. So it's like the main reason I want to make it in rap and to be an artist is to have that vocal platform, to be able to tell th people the things I'm doing now. Like, when I was in school, I made being smart cool. Like, I was one of the cool kids. It was like, somebody was like, oh, you, I'm like, you dumb. You happy to be dumb? Like, I had to spin it like that. So then all the girls looking like, stupid. You know what I mean? So it was like, that's what I want to do in a game as an artist. But it's like, if I don't get there, I'm not mad about it, you feel me? Because I love music genuinely. So like, I would, I would love to be a ghostwriter. I love to write. I love the A&R. I pick up so many, I find so many small artists on the internet, and then 10 months later, they be big. It's like, damn, people be like, you got the ear. And I be like, I don't know how I could become an a and r but I do that. Like, so I don't need to be the one. Everybody think they supposed to be the star. And mm -hmm. I don't need to be the star. So that's, that's what the rap thing is. And financially, I just want to be set. I just want to have that set for my family, you feel me? So that's what it is. Yeah, and I agree. I had a, uh, well, at least recently for me, I had a recent um, realization in, some, in that phase because, like, of course, like me being uh, in the media field and pursuing that uh, path, whatever, I had similar pressure on myself. Like, no, like, you know, I want this, this I want to be in this position to do this and be able to do these things, da da da, whatever. But now, Reese, I'm just on some shit. Like, one, I understand that the whole playing field is based on sheep behavior. Like, <laughs> I've been doing podcast shit for basically four years now. If me tomorrow said so I got the biggest biggest podcast ever, everybody would jump my dick and say I'm the I'm the next Charlemagne. I'm so yeah. I'm so provocative. <laughs> all that type of shit. That's just how it goes. Whatever. Um. So I still believe in my vision and talent, but I understand it's a matter of time, and I truly can't control it. I feel I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. 
and it's a matter of time, and certain things align, and people just dicky at a certain velocity, and <laughs> be that or whatever. Um, but one thing I can control ultimately is my money, and if I got my capital up, I can manipulate anything to be what I want to be with it. Mm-hmm. Especially in like the music media space where everything is mm-hmm. based off algorithms and just being put in your face. I remember mm-hmm. where everybody said Takashi was ass. You know, slowly but sure, nigga said, I mean. I mean, this is before he went to jail and shit. But like, he really not that bad. Like, you yeah. put, put someone in your face enough, it was a bit, and then, so you put someone in your face enough, and then it's a certain level of quality and authenticity, authenticity and uh, substance to it, it's going to go. But you have the oh, capital yeah. to push it to serve sort of regard. And so, and I, and I also relate to how Nipsey was, like, before he died, like, well, even before the, the last victory lap run, he was always content, comfortable, respected, but he was nowhere near the biggest or most successful. Yeah. Everybody. He had his bread up, mm-hmm. and he was good, and the rest will sort itself out. If you got your bread, if you got your capital, you'll be more comfortable with yourself and what your position is if you got your bread. Right? This shit, like, a lot of people don't realize, and I realized this super early, which is why, like, a lot of people see me pop back up, and I can generate a wave again. Like, I done died out and got my wave back plenty of times because I just realized that the whole music industry entertainment thing, it's it's a calculation, it's all calculated, it's all very calculated, it's all manipulated by money. So it's like, once I figured out how to do it myself, like for instance, I make a viral tweet every month on purpose. I make sure my tweet go viral every single month because I know how to manipulate that now. And that's something I studied, learned, and now I can do it. And it's like, that's basically what the entertainment game is. So if you, you got a product here, all right, what do, what, what do people like? They like this, this, and this, all right, let's break that down. Then we're gonna take that, let's put $10,000 in it to, to market it to these people. Uh, they, that's not really the demographic that like it. Let's put it here, that demographic don't like it. Let's put it here, and then they finally find it. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. So there's no reason to rush. Like for right now, at first my goal was, oh, right out of college, I'm gonna put the money behind myself and do this. But now I'm thinking, hmm, I could, I could pop off at what, 24, 25 could be my year. Really, because that's what I'm targeting now because I'd rather build my capital to where I could sit on it and really shoot the videos and it don't even touch, I don't feel it on my pocket. I can rent the cars, I can get the look, I can make the music and it's not, my pockets won't feel it. Mm-hmm. Because I studied it for so long, I'm gonna make it and I'm gonna get the voice. Even if I don't become an A-list, I'm gonna have a platform, I'm gonna have influence. And that's ultimately what you want. Even if you can't get 200,000 followers, as long as you get some influence behind you, mm-hmm. you're going to feel it. You're going to feel it. And Jake, so back to you. Where, where do you, where is like, would you say your trajectory, your path, or where do you, or your sights, I suppose? Where do you say like, are you, are you type of person that like, would like to be a tycoon, I suppose, eventually? Or uh, like, you want to own like, cause I actually had a conversation with someone recently. We were talking about like, you know, certain aspirations in regards to real estate. Now, you know me, like, I don't, that's not something I really am aiming for. Of course, if an opportunity presents itself, I don't see me just turning down something. But I don't want to be some nigga I own like half of the East Coast. Like, I'd be cool <laughs> just like, you know. Half of the East Coast. Yeah, like niggas, but niggas be like, yo, I just want to own whatever type shit, like, mm-hmm. like 500 unit type building, all that type shit. I'm like, no, if it's like in 20 years, I own like, you know, um, 20 or so property, shit like that, I could pass all these things down and have yeah. other things going on as well. I'll be yeah. pretty cool with that, whatever. So yeah. what are you, like some of your sites like? Uh, I just want a, a really good diversified uh, investment portfolio. So um, of course you have your multifamily and then the day that I, I'm able to buy a single family home where I live, that'll count as an asset. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would love to invest in certain brands, uh, you know, that I like uh, that aren't necessarily on the stock market. You know, like people yeah. want to see, like a, there's a brand called Ammo Stilo, which mm-hmm. is like, I remember from wow. very early inception. Man, you know, and like, on the show before, shout out to Jay. Yeah, and so like I would love to invest in brands like that and in, in startups. Um, but my, my natural progression, because uh, right now I've, I've had the opportunity to do some community development, uh, which is like an invaluable experience for me. Like it's something that I can take everywhere. But I, I, I've done it locally. I would love to be able to do it internationally. So, and then all the opportunities that will come from that. 
you know, because like you said, some people want to own the whole entire East Coast. I'm more of a let me find different pockets that I like, uh, different brands that I like in different areas and just diversify. So mm -hmm. maybe recreate what I'm doing here, if not in another state or city in the United States, maybe somewhere overseas that I've been or a place that I like over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, cause you, so you kind of speak more so from like, it got to move you personally to want to be yeah. like, even on just like the opportunity type thing. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. and, I and, think it's, and some, some opportunities, I've, I've, I've taken opportunities that I necessarily weren't my thing, but if I can gain information and apply it, mm -hmm. then I'll make that sacrifice too. Makes sense. Yeah, I know mm -hmm. that's something I can, I wouldn't be surprised that could uh, widen my uh, mentality or just horizons. Because, of course, I've traveled outside the country only for like vacations, but never. Mm -hmm. I, me personally, I'm a beach guy. I'd be on a resort. Yeah, <laughs> or relax type shit. But you know, I'm not seeing nothing really from a resort, or whatever. But you know, mm -hmm. if I really travel to certain cities and whether it's Asia or Europe or whatever, or, or certain pockets of the Caribbean, but off the resort, mm -hmm. you might really start seeing certain opportunities and things that you go, oh yeah, this could be, this could work here, this could work there. I could I'll take this back home. So that is mm -hmm. a question for both you guys. Mm -hmm. Are y'all buying Gap stock? Are y'all a believer? No. Because of the Kanye news, of course, whatever. Man, I looked at it. That, that first day jump was crazy. I was waiting for the dip to see where it would dip and find right. this new low. So it found this new low. I think I think I might buy in, to be honest. I do, you know me. So, yeah, man, I believe, let me say this real quick. I meant to say this earlier. Like, <laughs> like, like I respect Rel. He, I, but I, like, me, I'm a person that believes definitely in self-awareness and knowing yourself. Mm-hmm. We not the same, and I respect that we not the same. Cause even when I be seeing his tweets, I be like, all right, cool. I'm gonna keep this back in mind, look into it, whatever. But I don't have the mental capacity to be on his type of time. He really be on that real swing day trade shit, catching here, get it there. I tried that a few days time. I was going crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's not for everybody. But that's, that's you gotta know I it though. You gotta know it. Yeah. What's yeah, up? Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna do it though, cause I, I think that Yeezy brand, bro. Yeezy brand not going nowhere. And when he get that gap, that gap foundation. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. What do we do with Adidas? Mm -hmm. Exactly. What do we do with Adidas? How about you, Jake? What do you, what do you think, man? Uh, honestly, I don't, know, I don't know enough about it. I have to look into it more. OK. I've, I've, like, as of recently, I've kind of taken, uh, I haven't really been looking at like, my stocks. It's been like pretty consistent growth. Mm -hmm. I would, there were times where I was like a, aggressive like uh, from day to day, which is cool, but uh, I just I've just taken a break. Yeah, right. but definitely something that I'll I'll, I'll look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when I heard about, it, I definitely was thinking like, um, I, I I agree. Like the Adidas thing, I saw Adidas. I looked at the charts. That shit went from when he jumped in. It was thirty. Today is one thirty. I'm like, I ain't saying Gap gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna do something like that shit. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a believer. My thing is though, it don't launch. When they said the, the start, they gonna start launching 2021. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's July, so I guess maybe September would be a good buy mm -hmm. to see if it's growing or if it's just staying steady until they release and people see what it's gonna do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely, I definitely would buy in. So, bro, you being an aggressive type person, what mm -hmm. would be like a um? Just for like not the first day of course, but in the beginning of time when you buying into that, looking down the road, what do you think you want to put into that? Just personally, if you would be willing to speak on that. So if Gap right now, that stock is at about it went back down about fourteen, twelve dollars. Mm -hmm. So me personally, I probably put well, let me let me step back. It depends on the size of your portfolio. Of course. So Say if I had two thousand dollars for long term and five thousand long term, gotcha. I believe in gap enough that I'll probably do a twenty percent investment in that gap stock. Gotcha. You know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wouldn't just all in on it, but I probably, I'm gonna probably do it a little heavy. You know, because so, so twenty percent would be heavy to you. That's like a heavy low. Yeah, for low? me personally, because yeah. I like to uh, keep mine kind of diverse, except in my day trading account. Uh -huh. My long term though, I like to keep it down first because I, mean, I play different sectors and retail is not really one of them. 
Me but either. I would just because again, so twenty percent, and I think I'll shell more money into there. So a twenty percent start is going to get smaller and smaller as I keep adding money. So that's why I say twenty percent from about five thousand, it'll be a good start. Got you. Um, do y'all hate black women like the rest of black men? Supposedly, of course, they're like all that of stuff. You know, black men, we do everything wrong. We hate black women. But I say all to say, though, so the real question is. Um, <laughs> but what I've noticed is with all this gender war shit that's annoyed the fuck out of me, made me actually to take a step back from Twitter. Just too much nonsense shit like that. But um, but I feel like the back end results of it have been a lot of what I believe is like caping towards it. A lot of people trying to just be performative towards like, no, I love black women and I love women and women are perfect and and all that shit, whatever. Um and I feel it comes off disingenuous because anything that's performative isn't real. So it's like, it's like, what's the even point of it? And I saw people airing out, uh, did y'all hear about this Mark Lamont Hill thing? Who? Mark Lamont Hill? Nah. Oh, yeah, so you heard about Russell Simmons and his accusations, right? Yeah. yeah. So I believe on Drink Champs, Mark Lamont Hill was on there with a few people talking about some Mark Lamont Hill type shit. Like, you know, black social justice, whatever. And Russell Simmons, I, I haven't seen this clip person, so I'm not sure if it was like a Zoom thing or they was in person. But somehow Russell Simmons became a part of this conversation. And they said Mark Lamont Hill instantly was like uncomfortable. And he was like, uh, like suppose he, because he, 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 first of all, when the clip came out, he got grind the fuck up. Oh my God, you claim you love black women, you protect black women, but you didn't check this man right here. You didn't do nothing. And so he gave a response saying, what, I was texting the producers right away saying I was uncomfortable. I know he's supposed to be here. This isn't right. I hope you don't release this, da 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 da, da. And that was pretty much the gist of it. But I thought it was interesting, a lot of people when they was grind him the fuck up, they was like, you claim to be this guy, protect black women at all costs and all that performative extra shit. Mm -hmm. One, how you don't press him or something, but also how you don't even question him. So generally, what are your thoughts on this whole energy around this gender war stuff and this and that, and possibly the disingenuous re, uh, back end of men trying to show certain things that isn't really them? And just generally, what do y'all think? All that stuff. Off my friend, let's start with this first. What do y'all think about people saying he should have checked them in this situation? So what, if one of you guys are Mark on my hill and Russell Simmons pops in on a chat, what should happen in your mind? I don't know. That's a. I can't even. I don't because I because I, I don't know the whole situation. Like even you just explained that, I still don't understand like what happened. Mm. But I mean, I guess you'd be like, "Oh, Russell Simmons, get the fuck out of here!" But it's like, did he pop in the chat on some like uncomfortable shit? That's what you're saying. No, like, he really came in. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One thing. He came in genuinely talking about what they were talking about. No, you're right. Black people. No, we uh we. I mean, I, it was really on some, they were all in the same type of time. They like, wanted to be like, shut the fuck up, you abuse black women. Yeah, or to be like, answer for this, answer for this question or I, something. Like that. I guess, I guess, okay, I see the point. The point is, you want to talk about this, but you haven't acknowledged this yet. So you can't yet. Okay, a point. Like, that's the thing with me about this whole, like, how you saying this whole gender work thing. As I've been on Twitter more, and this current climate, like, niggas have been saying wildly stupid shit and dangerous shit. Mm -hmm. And I realized, especially just getting older and growing into becoming a man, it's like, yo, terrible fucking people. Like, I get where a lot of women be coming from. Mm -hmm. Of course, me personally, I glance over a lot of, I fucking hate black men tweets because, like, I don't feel it's directly towards me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't take it personal. So, like, right. I can't really, but, like, I, I don't know, yeah. like, you, I, you yeah, I don't even care about the tweets. I hate the energy that it's causing. Because yeah, 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 the discourse it's, between it's, the two. Yeah, and I feel right now we have a great moment of possible upliftment yeah. or progression. I feel these type of pockets of shit is distractions and it's like fucking up the momentum possibly. We over here worrying about bigger shit and niggas out here still like who we even talking about for real, for real? It was like, do we, we or do we both agree that rapists are wrong? Or what the fuck are we talking about? Like this is what yeah. like, this is even about. So yeah. That's why that's that was a good I think I personally think it's because niggas don't double down on stuff a lot behind women. That's why they get mad. 
So like, they'll see some shit and like, LOL it off or be like, chill, bro. But it's like, that nigga just said some dangerous shit. That's, that's not bro. Tell that nigga, you're fucking wild. That's why I think they be mad. It's more sort of dismissive tone of things where it should be pressing. And even if it's creating discourse because somebody's saying, oh, no, nah, I don't, I, we don't hate black women. It's like, don't debate it. Just show it. Be like, okay, you acknowledge how they feel. Okay, you feel this way. I'm going to do this to show you I am not feeling this way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But a lot of people take it personal and they, and they fire back. And that's where the discourse is coming. It's like, acknowledge how everybody's feeling. It's like the other day. I, I didn't understand why they said, why they made all black lives matter, like a thing, for like transgender and all that stuff. But I mean, I guess I get it intersectional. But like somebody broke it down to me like it's intersectional. And I mean, some people are disregarding them being included. And I'm like, okay, I get that. I don't have a rebuttal. It's like, whatever, man. Mm-hmm. If you want to use that, use it. But are we still in black lives? Cool, okay. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all it had to be. But a lot of niggas are like, nah, they're hijacking the shit. And it's like, it don't gotta be there. I'm gonna get a jam real quick, but we actually touched on something I'm about to say now, a little before you got in the chat, where like, we said something about a certain hip, uh, hypocritical type nigga. And we'll go back to that. But I was like, I don't even think about that type of shit. It really just be over there. So, mm-hmm. but those types of, like, again, I, I, I've seen it sparingly where someone, if someone speak about a trans person got killed, and someone might be like, not right now. And it's like, no. So I those type of people don't even exist to me. Like, like I'm not some type of trans activist, but I literally am not against trans people. So like mm-hmm. I don't even put a need to even have these debates or thoughts of like, mm-hmm. oh, mm-hmm. black men first and then women and then children. And then tra- no, nobody should be getting killed for no reason. That's just <laughs> common <laughs> logic. Like, so maybe have some that's why I said first when I said I take a step back, I start realizing that like again. I'm privileged and fortunate that I come from a good foundation of mom that instills certain things into me. And I have great relationships with women in real life, not just on screens and all this shit, whatever. And I realize a lot of women don't be having these foundations. Like they probably don't have, they wasn't raised in a certain way or, or instill certain things. And that's why they end up having, um, and they, was, they don't have the right friends or interactions with people. So certain things happen to them. But I'm like, yo, like I have great relationships with women. That we don't have debates in real life and be talking about damn Q, why you no, we actually love each other, we good. So like it's cool. Like, I don't need to even try to figure this shit out because cool. Mm-hmm. Y'all got it, y'all got fucked up lives or situations. A lot of people mm-hmm. fuck you over, your friend, your girlfriend left you at a party drunk. That would never happen to a perfect friend I'm cool with. I'm, I can't relate to these type of things. Or so I'd be like, all that shit is over there and it don't even involve me for real, for real. So that's why I be thinking about it. But so mm-hmm. um yeah. Yeah. So, Jay, you yeah, yeah. so, so if I was Lamont Hill, right? Um, because he's an advocate and he speaks on all these social justice things, um, I would definitely have to question Russell Simmons. I, I would, uh, and that's no different than if I was uh, on a call with a racist or anti-Semite or like a, a vocal misogynist or, you know, uh, a woman who hates men uh, mm-hmm. on, on a discriminatory way. I, I feel like uh, I don't want to be associated with that. And I'm on the call with them. Uh, I'm having dialogue with them. If it goes against my morals, I'm definitely going to speak out on it because I, I do that now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I do it unapologetically. So it wouldn't change because it's Russell Simmons. You know, just, you know, it is what it is. And if they didn't like it, then I would, you know, calmly decline, you know, <laughs> and that's that. You yeah. feel like this, like, I, I had a conversation with one person and it was like, they feel like black people get into this pattern sometimes where they feel like the expression of throw the baby out with the bath for it. So it was like, and we kind of feel like if a person isn't perfect, then everything is discounted. So like if Russell Simmons, what he's saying is, again, I didn't see it, but I'm, he was saying something along the lines of, what they all agree with, no, I'm black, we in a great time, we gotta do this, this shit is wrong, white supremacy, all that type of shit, right? If he's saying these things, all these are facts, should it automatically be discounted, or right? like, we don't, this shit don't matter, don't exist, because of what these looming accusations are, or should it be like, no, we can hear this, but no, you should answer these questions as well, like, what are your thoughts on that? Whatever. Cause you know, a lot, of, a lot of people really feel like, I don't give a fuck what you saying, nigga, because what you did this. 
I mean, yeah, I guess it it could be both. Cause I mean, I think I think sometimes there are people who made mistakes just unknowingly, like just being ignorant of the situation or uneducated of the situation, and they'll say something or do something or whatever, and people are like, oh no, you fucking canceled. And it's like they 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 have good knowledge to add to a movement or what we're doing, but it's like people are like fuck anything you have to say now, even though you were a mogul, even though you were a trailblazer, you were this and were that. Fuck that. We don't care anymore. But I feel like it should be acknowledge what you did, you know, understand what you did wrong, mm-hmm. and then add to what we need to move forward to. And that's why I think the the the, the messed up part is is happening right now with cancel culture because nobody could move forward with us after you cancel them for whatever reason. It's like once they cancel, you have to leave them, kick them off the fucking boat, and keep sailing. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think that's the that's the biggest issue with cancel culture. Not even the fact that they like, like we need his head. Like, cause sometimes we do need a motherfucking head. Mm-hmm. But can we Educate them. Come with us, possibly. Then bring them with us. Somebody who we once loved. Like, if they're past that point, sure. Like, you try to do this, and then they're like, fuck what y'all talking about. I'm doubling down. Then it's, all right, get the fuck out of here. And I feel that's the big thing about the Russell Simmons thing, possibly. Like, I understand people saying, no, fuck everything he stands for or say, because because it's like, it's one thing if he was like, you know what? Everything he said is true. I was wilding. I should be brought to justice, possibly, whatever. But when you're still denying it, it's like a That's slap in the face to the thing. So, no, you, like you said, one of the things you said was like, you acknowledge it, you accept it, and now I'm trying to move on. But if you never even try to face it, then it's like, how can we yeah. move on, in a sense? If he's yeah. Uh, and the culture has to decide uh, who, who they want to throw to the wayside versus who they don't. So, like, to your, to your point that, um, all the things that he has done and has spoken out versus the allegations. And if the culture decides that he's canceled, then that's a decision that they have to deal with uh, by losing a cultural pillar. And that's not excusing him from his, his thing, his uh, issues, because I believe rape is foul. Um, and, you know, I'm like, if you, if you rape someone, then, you know, that's you need to be put away. You need to be put under the gel. You need to uh, be up for lethal injection. I hold it up there with pedophilia. I feel like some things, uh, yes, it's wrong and people should be able to grow from, but uh, you have to live with the decisions that you make. And, um, you know. Do y'all believe that, so because one thing I always found interesting, especially in the black culture or even like rap culture specifically, is that you know murder is pretty acceptable? Like you know, in the block, you get killed people. A lot of people talk about killing people is no big deal at all. But and I agree with you, rape and pedophilia are just certain things, certain different heinous type, different level of heinous acts. However, if I kill you, you can't come back. Like this shit is this whole life is over, or whatever. So, mm-hmm. is there something to be said about how we the hierarchy of crimes of like, no, you a rapist and ped- pedophile? Everybody hates you. No rap. But if you a killer, it's like, no, it's my man's though. Like, free him and yeah. Him. Like, yeah. And some people say, no, rape is worse no matter what. They are traumatized forever, this and that. But then it's like, no, but this nigga is gone forever. They will never come back. I can't lie, I'm one of them people. I, I had this conversation in college, like, thousands of times. Like, we talk about stuff like this all the time. And one thing we came down to was, like, murder is subjective. <laughs> so that, like, no, that's facts though. But it's, yeah. it's, like, it's like is murder. So the question I think it was was like, is murder always inherently like an evil act? Like because is it always based like? And I guess it was yeah because it's always based in some type of revenge, but it's not because I mean somebody break into my house and I kill them is right. like that's self-defense or self-defense. It, it's like, and, it's, and I think coming from where we come from, a lot of people know a lot of these murders. Niggas be intended targets. Like let's like some some people fuck up and they hitting kids and women and all that, but a lot of the times the lot of these targets. You see know what I'm saying? And they and they reaping what they sow. They living that life. So it's like I'm I can't I can't equate somebody getting killed for robbing somebody for a couple pairs of weed to 
a woman who was trying to go home and, and a nigga raped her. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I can't equate that. Like, of course, I'm going to hold that rape is way lower. Like, you, you raped an innocent woman for nothing. This nigga killed somebody who was probably going to kill him a couple months later. So it's like, I don't know. Me, I'm one of them people. No, I, I feel it. And, um, um, yeah, I'm probably going to say though. But I just think it's, uh, but you guys ain't even say Jake? Right, think about the stuff. I was just gonna say, uh, um, you know, we have our exceptions for things naturally, and like, you know, if someone invades your property uh, and, and you kill them out of self-defense, whatever, you know, that those are one of the things that are like as old as time. Like, you don't go into another man's house mm-hmm. and try to take what's theirs and, and try to hurt them. Now you're on the turf. It's, you know, and, and now you're subject to whatever you're subject to. So, you know, we, we definitely have our preferences, you know, talking about people who are in the game and they're living a certain lifestyle and the, the rules that go with that. Um, and I know at one point in time, like with the mob, uh, at one point it was like, you know, women and children are off limits. Right. Uh, but then in our community, sometimes women and children catching the bullets. Yeah, there's no code of conduct in a lot of t- not a lot of regards. Yeah, so uh, it's it's all ugly. It's all ugly to me. That's what I say though. To real point, that's honestly one thing I never understood. Because of course, like you know, coming from we come from, you, everybody knows certain niggas that do certain things, or whatever. But I've always been under the understanding if something happened to them, I can't be surprised or like just baffled. But of course, you'd be sad. You have the right to grieve or whatever because yeah. person you was close to them, or whatever. Yeah. But shit happens when you do certain things like it's just cause and effect but but when, so I, I feel that's like a thing that's like a like human nature default niggas just brain just go into amnesia oh my god i can't believe this happened yeah. to him. this nigga yeah. was robbing niggas all summer like what you, yeah. what's supposed to happen to this man so yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah like what's what what would you thought this is going to end like i don't understand but back to rose point as well though Back to the equating or the comparing the acts, you know, if you raise some, of course, like it's fucked up. It's, it's truly no motive. Like you say, like murder can be subjective. What happened? What's the situation? Whatever. Rape, it never makes sense. Like you just grab yeah. someone, whatever. Yeah. Rape, there's nothing you can do to uh, understand that. However, though, like you said, he do, he do, even in the streets, we doing some shit, whatever, and I kill you because you could have been doing something to come back with me, whatever. However, though, you could have changed your life. You could have moved away and did something or whatever. So it's always the it's always the sense that it's final. Like it's nothing to come back. Yeah. Like, man, that yeah. family is affected forever as well, type thing, and the trickle down effects forever and type shit, whatever. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think it just. I never really thought of that though. Like, like the the part like they could have reconciled. Like the Malcolm X effect. Malcolm Little became Malcolm X, but yeah. if he died, we would have never knew. Yeah, I I I, I, don't, I didn't like. Cause I'm so used to. Of course, where we come from. I mean, I mean yeah, and I know people that that uh, did what they did, and they, but they spent their time in jail. When they got out, they got out on some shit. Like, right? mm-hmm. this, I got a trade. I'm like, so it's like, yeah, but it's like, what do you, what can you do? Like, mm-hmm. call the cops on you. Mm-hmm. It's like, what can you do? Right. So, um. What would y'all yeah. say? So I've been having like a lot of reflection during this whole first half of this year, especially during this whole pandemic shit, whatever. I just feel like there's a lot of been like a lot of divine intervention and alignment shit like that. I'm not like a super spiritual type person generally, whatever. I feel like this year has been kind of un- uh, unavoidable in a sense. The first of all, it's 2020, clearer vision, perfect vision, all that shit, whatever. That um, the fact that it's a fucking pandemic and whole economy crash. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, that's when I just start getting to a certain level of literacy and discipline to even possibly capitalize on this seamlessly once in a lifetime moment. Also, right. other things would happen. I'm having a kid now. So a bunch of shit could happen at the same right. time that who would have thought whatever. So what's something that maybe that y'all learned during this time or maybe you changed about yourself or that's affected you? Any thoughts from just this current state of affairs and time? Well, first off, congrats, man, on the kid. Thank you, man. Thank you. Big, big congrats, man. Uh, so, like, you know, it's funny because, like, my family and some of some of the people that I, I, I work with and uh, some peers, we, in 2019, we were anticipating 2020 market crash. Mm. Um, so 
I, I remember a lot of time was spent making sure, you know, you're going in the year with as little debt as you can, um, uh, cutting back on spending. And real um, quick though, was it because you've heard about the COVID shit or something else in general? Like, it, it was just because of, uh, just because like what the market was anticipating to do and the signs that, that, um, you know, we were basically reading and seeing what was going to happen. Because um, it really couldn't saying, sustain. That's the thing I learned as well, like with my, you know, studies or whatever. It's like certain people that, one, that's right, everybody know the Warren Buffett quote, when there's blood in the streets, buy, all that shit, whatever. But also that people, when you got money and certain awareness and knowledge, niggas always clean up during these times and they always see a shit coming, like whether it was the Y2K shit or the internet bubble or the 08 crash, or it's like it happens cyclical every yeah. time. And when niggas that are in position, they clean up, and people, and the, and the majority that isn't, are just fucked every time. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, next so time, I'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> but see, seeing those signs and everything, and um, what, what was the initial question again, Drew? Things that you've learned or affected you or you changed or? Okay, whatever. so I've learned, I've learned to. Are you um, prepared in 2019? Yeah, prepared in 2019, uh, 2020 has taught me to uh, like to focus, to focus on the core things that matter. Um, of course, it slowed me down. So a lot of social things that I, that I was doing, I'm not doing anymore. Uh, it pushed for a lot of reflection. Um, you know, I cleared my mind of a lot of things. Uh, and it, it really instilled in me just the importance of financial literacy and, and not, I don't know, just being as fiscally conservative as possible. And I know I was, I'm fiscally conservative anyway, but it just reminded me that I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be up and, uh, not stay up uh and a lot of that is going to be contingent on the decisions that i make uh where i choose to spend my time who i spend it with mm -hmm. um where i spend my money how much i spend it uh and just realizing that sometimes it's better off to just live in your bubble with the people that you love the friends that you have and just be around like-minded people uh and you know with us having the social distance it it made it easier to kind of uh, lock in everything that I want to lock in. I like it. So, uh, and I, I agree. I, that's, that's also been part of like my realization of like, let's like say when I, when I took a step back from social media in certain regards, like just tapping in with certain people that I maybe lost touch with, or I just, just talked mm -hmm. to them regularly and realized this shit really don't be matter. And that's on this screen, these strangers that I don't know for over or even people that, I don't file, but they be they retweet it on my timeline. So I just see thoughts that I don't even give a fuck about for over, but just condition that this is normal to me. I'm seeing a bunch of thoughts of people I don't even know or care about for over. And yep. that don't even matter in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh real mm -hmm. anyone. So well, for me, I just a big thing for me, I just it just like it made me sit with my thoughts and like just do a lot of introspection and figure out like who I am. Like, cause I mean, I've been, I was ripping and running so much, I guess when I finally had to sit down and like, I was looking ahead and looking at now, it was like, I felt, I didn't know like where I was going and I really didn't pay too much attention to where I've been or what had happened to me. Like I was just trying to get to the point I'm in now. And now that I'm living in all of my five year goals, I started to feel lost because I didn't know what was next for myself. You know what I mean? So it was like that was a lot of people to get out of school because there's no finish line no more. It's like yeah, you know what I mean. So it's like that that allowed me to really sit back and like get into me and like decide like what do I need to do moving forward to like really like I done, it been deaths and everything like throughout school and whatever like people have died on me and it was so much stuff and it's just like I pushed to the side because like I had to go to get to it. and it's like now that I got here it was like so much stuff started hitting me like once I got a chance to just sit, you know what I mean? And it allowed me to, and still right now, I'm trying to like work through it and deal with that stuff. But like, in doing that, I'm starting to just be like my true authentic self. Like, 
Yeah. I don't care how I'm perceived on social media. Like I don't. Like, I'm going to talk the way I want to talk. I'm a joke how I want to joke. Mm. Like, I, like, cause it's not important. Like, it don't matter. Like, who I am is who I am. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then some people don't really ever get to that point. Who they are is who people expect them to be. Uh-huh. So it's like I'm trying to be me as much as I can be me. I'm trying to learn as much as I can learn about myself and how I can just be my ultimate happy, truly happy. It's healthy self, and that's what I've been working on, and that's what I'm trying to keep working on, even past this. You know what I, mean? mm-hmm. I like it, I like it, and I, I agree with that as well. Like I feel, and that's back to when I said, like you know, I was fortunate enough to have a certain level of awareness of myself, and I realized other people, most people online, don't be having that shit. And I feel a lot of people, even in the way they present themselves online, so you know, we know people, but I'm like, that's not even you. It's like this, this, this is a persona projection that you create to even have this type of voice or energy. Mm-hmm. It's like everybody don't, they don't even know how to keep this. I don't, I don't want to use this cliche phrase, but keep the same energy, but keep their same self through, mm-hmm. through and through, whether it's on a screen or on a podcast or in person, because they still trying to figure themselves out in a certain way. And you know, social media just put up this whole like, uh whole other obstacle to even try to figure this out though because you're constantly seeing things you're constantly trying to project certain things and you still ain't figured who the fuck you are yet whatever yeah um mm-hmm. another thought i had recently was i do believe that you know our generation in the next 10 to 20 years once you know the bulk of our kids are approaching adulthood whether it's 18 or 21 whatever i think we they gonna be we gonna really kill this parents and shit I feel like our generation just has a certain level of mental awareness, emotional intelligence, finance. Of course, a lot of niggas in you know, the whole country, you know, of course, poor people gonna be poor people. It is what it is. People, people still got to figure out certain disciplines and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I think probably the ratio of people of having an enlightened level of pro- progression and all that type of shit is gonna be higher than it has in the past, or whatever. I don't wanna say too much in the past, let's just say. The last two generations or so, whatever, or at least the last generation. And I feel like our that next generation gonna be on some shit because we they're gonna have a, a lot more launch pads than a lot of our generation had. I just think our the way we think is just going to amount to a lot, a lot of shit going on. Whatever. Have y'all thought about that? And specifically, yeah. how do y'all feel about just but I know one of you spoken recently that you definitely care about which one to pass down to your kids in the future, whatever. So, Jen, what are your thoughts on that? And just your own self and how you look at yourself. Whenever you do have kids, if you do whatever. Bro. Oh. Oh, well, I was just saying, like, basically, uh, I feel like I feel like it's because a lot of people complain about the current climate and like society and like how people expect you to be aware and understand things. And I mean like it got its benefits because it kind of pushed us to where we are now. To even as black, our generation as a whole, like that collective wanting to have that knowledge and that financial literacy and wanting to build, like that's a direct uh, effect of just the the social climate that we're in. And I think because of that, the next generation is just, that's what it's going to be. That's what they're building on. They're building on the education that we have now received, things that were deprived from our parents. their siblings, like the internet gave it to us, essentially. Mm-hmm. It was like, once they couldn't restrict it, they made it, they made it mandatory, is how I feel about it. Like once they couldn't restrict your access to information, they made it mandatory for you to know it mm-hmm. and to abide by these social constructs. And like I said earlier, real quick, things are be, became cool. Like if you're using college, you say you make yeah. make be smart, but it's cool to be on some shit. It's cool to want to build shit. It's cool to, exactly. to not want to be stagnant. It's cool to be, oh, okay, let's, 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 let's not just save money. Let's actually figure mm-hmm. out other ways to diversify our portfolio and figure out what that means and that type of shit, whatever. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's funny, like, with the whole, like, stock shit, of course, like, we see trends happen every day, niggas going to wave and all shit, whatever. But I see the narrative of, like, oh, now everybody a stock trader. Now everybody a stock broker. But no, nigga. First of all, this is the one trend that everybody should get it or figure out and get some form in. But of course, yes, because it's common now to be talking about because the, t- the state of affairs we're in, see a lot more people gonna be involved in it, but that's still something to figure out and get your hands in in some regard. Like, you know, don't let it go over your head. 
Learn as much as you can. Like education is just like key. Like it sounds so cliche, but it's really facts. Like that's why I just try to learn so much. Not even sometimes I put little threads on Twitter. Like you see me, like I put threads on stuff that's happening, like the Earn It app, for instance. Like, yeah, I'll talk more about that later on. Google the Earn It app. See how you can stop it from becoming a mom because it can really change the internet as we know it today. And our voices could be just wiped out using this one law. So make sure you look into that. Find out how you could contribute to stopping it. So it's like education is key. And that's why our generation, the ones following us, they're going to be set because we have, even if we don't know everything, we know a lot more. Facts. We're building a lot more. Facts. That's the key. We building a lot more and doing a lot more too as well. And not even no shade. Everybody should be doing more and building more as time goes on. And seeing us do this is going to spark something. Like look at look at the um D one young boys like like Mikey Williams and McCord. Love like, it. I love they're it. They're going to HBCUs just because of where this current climate is and people just pushing that. Like let's let's be self sufficient. Like so, it's only going to get way crazier. You know what I mean? So I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Anything yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same, same. Especially uh, as it regards to the, the trauma. Like a lot of the traumas that we endured uh, growing up. Um, I know that I've made uh, it my mission to not only heal from certain things, but also to make sure that the cycle doesn't continue. Mm -hmm. And I see that that's common with a lot of uh, millennials. Uh, them being more, you know, taking more holistic approaches, uh, you know, even as regards to eating, um, as it regards to yeah. Yeah, parenting, um, overall health, and also just being cognizant of the different, the different ways that you can generate income and provide. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're definitely opening our minds to uh, the world and, and more possibilities. Mm -hmm. sure. Do y'all think there are certain things that y'all guys already know or think about that, you know, I want to, I would like to pass these traditions or patterns or tendencies down to my kids and other things I definitely wouldn't. Is there anything you guys can think about like that in regards to yourself that y'all uh, analyze about your upbringing or uh, childhood? Yeah. So one thing I, I learned in college, you know, and I, I did, it's, it was so crazy how like, it got to me because it was like one day I was in this little like forum and we was just talking and I started talking about like my dad and like how from sophomore year of college, which it was from the time I was born, I couldn't really remember like us saying I love you to each other more than about five times. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But it's like I knew it, but it's like we never said it. Mm -hmm. it was like, I wasn't comfortable like saying it. It was easy, and it was just easier for me to say, like, I hate stuff than it was for me to say I love stuff. Because it's weird if you just love something, but it's like, you hate it, you just hate it. But it shouldn't be like that. It should, mm -hmm. If anything, it should be the opposite. So I feel like being that emotionally aware of where you are and how you feel about things, like, that's, that was a big, big thing, I feel like, for me, like, just knowing yourself emotionally. That's just like, it can take your life to the next level, like, for real. Because there's some people who never deal with a lot of stuff, don't know a lot of stuff about themselves, and it like destroys them as they get older and older. It just destroys them emotionally. So I think for me, that was the biggest one, like identifying stuff like that, like small, like just me and my dad saying, I love you, sister. Love is really the answer. Love could really, it's super cliche, but love really do fix a lot yeah, of shit. With people it's people, people don't have love and they fuck up other shit. People, you know, Love can change a lot of shit. My dad, he was similar when he grew up. He grew up in probably in a similar uh, dynamic where his dad was, you know, he provided, he was there, but it wasn't, it was a very, like, kind of like a distant bond. Him and like, I was so, so when he raised me, he was super affectionate. Now, you go, no, I love you. Like, all that type. Yeah. He, he can't text me something quick and casual without saying, all right, I love you. Like, he, he, can't, he has to say it every single time we talk. So that's just how he did it. And I understand that about him. And I just feel like my dad too, another thing I didn't want to say, it was like, he he kind of, because he grew up that way, when he was doing us, so he felt like, the way he said I love you was like providing. Right. So like, his I love you was like, I'm gonna make it happen. Like, even if it was difficult, if he said I'm gonna make it happen, he was gonna make it happen. And that was his way of showing like, I love you more than anything. Because mm -hmm. I was poor when you asked me this, but I made it happen, you know what I mean? So like, 
And he always was supportive sports and all that. He was always there. But it's just that emotional tie was always the one thing that was like, it wasn't really. And then once I learned about him, because, you know, we don't know our parents. Once I learned his childhood, what he went through, I understood why he was the way he was and how to approach him to break him out of it, too. So. Jake, anything? Uh, just just uh, making sure that I that I communicate effectively uh, and from a place of reason and not uh, emotion. Like I know there's a time to be emotion, emotional, and I can you know come in as happy, I can come in as angry or whatever. But just uh, being in a, in a clear mind space and uh, you know. Because if you're not, it affects what you say and how you say it, mm -hmm. and which can uh, negatively impact a situation. So that's definitely one thing that I'm going to do better, um, you know, when I have a family and children. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, um, what I was about to say. Uh, yeah, I know another thing that I've went through in the past couple years, to me, it's like been an interesting evolution of me and my, like, my, uh, my parents' relationship of, like, recognize and understand like I said earlier when I said I thought our generation is on a certain different trajectory of progression or whatever so over time I feel like I've you know I've took I've took pride in being able to be feeling like I could teach my parents something not you know and that those roles kind of being more interchangeable now like no I can put you on things I can tell you something and I can you know correct certain things about you whatever and and of course that don't mean I respect you less I love you less but you, I should be able to do it. You put everything into me to be great in life, whatever. So I should be able to be like, all right, now I got you and I can help you with this now and all that type of things. Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, it should be the natural evolution where I feel like a lot of times those things don't happen with yeah. uh, like, shit like that. Because I feel like, like I said, we don't be, a lot of people don't really under, understand or learn about their parents. So you can't even really figure certain, th certain things out to unpack it and then mm -hmm. maybe see we can build on it or whatever. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Do y'all think, so one of the question is, like I said, we talking about progression and trajectory and all that shit. If y'all can just put like a year time frame on it, when do y'all think black people, if ever, will be <laughs> at a certain level of freedom in America? Will it be in, let's just say, we think it'll be in our lifetimes? I think it'll be like the last scene of the book when you old as hell and you walk in and you, <laughs> and you just smile like, Man, this is this is, really is it us though, or is it our kids as old as shit though? Yeah, I think I think I, I think by the time our kids is like older and we old as fuck. Okay, I, we can see it though. All right, so we'll be able to see it like all right, it's it's almost done. Like okay, I can be the product, the final product. Cause I, I and that's and that's and and this is crazy. I feel that's granted the current. Like this very moment we're in, progressing right. at the same rate. Cause right. I do think this is the moment right now. Right. right. But the shit died, restart. It's not happening in the same way. Man. Yeah, I agree. How about you? Are you are you as optimistic or what? Um, I would love to see it because I mean, well, freedom for me is is um like. Uh, I tend to measure freedom as like economic freedom, financial freedom, just because I know, you know, how powerful the dollar is and the, and the opportunities it can For afford sure. you. Uh, and and it's, it's money that makes politicians maybe change the way laws are, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's them getting money or losing money, unfortunately. But, uh, I mean, the way the current trend now is for black wealth in America, I believe, like, our... our uh, our bottom 50% of people are like uh, in negative uh, debt, yeah, like, yeah. like they're in like negative yeah. net worth. Yeah. Wait, so, it's so negative. like it's negative. What? The net worth, like it's negative. Like oh, like, got it. a debt and owning nothing. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, and an article came out yeah. and said that the black, the black white wealth gap uh, is the same as it was in 1969. So, I mean, if, if the economic trends continue the way that they are, uh, then I, I don't really foresee it uh, in my lifetime. Uh, but, you know, I'm not ruling anything out. Uh, it's all about how adamant we are and 
the decisions that we make have to be done in a way that it produces exponential results um, because we need to make up for loss, loss time, mm. you know? So I'm optimistic about it. It may take more than just African-Americans. You know, we have a whole continent uh, that is mostly black over in Africa um, that has resources and other things. And, you know, we got South America and the Caribbean. So, you know, we can get creative. Uh, I like the steps that we're taking now, uh, but the biggest progression will come when the majority of our population gets on board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, something you said earlier that we can get back to. You you said that uh, talking Jacob. You said uh, you feel black people prioritize things kind of wrong. Or that I forgot was exactly what you remember. We said yeah, 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 yeah. I I like. I know we were talking. We were we were talking about. Um, I was saying how I agree that we need to be adamant and, and, you know, go against the unjustful killings by police and go against uh, racist uh, judicial systems. Um, I just get confused when on one breath we're talking about how we don't want um, black people killed by police, which we don't. I don't think uh, any of us disagree about that. However, we're not adding uh, the same conviction to the rate at which we kill ourselves. And it's not to say that we, sh we shouldn't care about uh, unjustful cop killings. It's just the fact that if we're looking at raw data and raw numbers, uh, there's a rate at which cops kill black people. And there's a rate at which black people die in police custody. Uh, and it's significantly lower than the rate that we kill ourselves. And I've, I've, heard, the, I've heard the argument that uh, we don't pay cops to kill us, which we don't. Um, however, are we then putting a dollar on black life if we're prioritizing death? Because, you know, like you, like you were saying earlier, once you're gone, you're gone. Uh, so it's like, I know people say, hey, we need to go against cops, which we do. But the question then becomes, if we're trying to make new turf and make new progression going inward, as opposed to starting home base going outward, I have a problem with that game plan. Because, you know, when you look at, you look out throughout history, you look at different war tactics, um, whether it's Montezuma, whether it's um, Hannibal, whether it's Napoleon, you have all these people and resources that you can pull from. Uh, none of them are starting uh, not in their home turf. So if we can't, if I can't clean up my own house and clean up my own finances, how can I expect to clean up the finances of a community? I think that there's a progression that needs to be followed that's backed by science, that's backed by math and physics. And, you know, so sometimes I question how we go about certain things. And I think that when we let a majority lead that's not educated, we're going to get, you know, uneducated results. That's, that's how I feel. I mean, I, I, I agree with the point that we do need to mobilize, like stop hurting each other as a community. But I do believe that that will always be a weak pivot, generally because like black on black crime just isn't even a real thing. Like white on white crime, have you ever heard of it? Never, it's just crime. Same thing in a black community, black on black crime is like, that was a narrative for me, I feel like. And granted, we are not them. We should be better knowing what we've been through in the past. We should be better as a people, but because we're not better, shouldn't be a reason to be like, oh, you don't deserve rights because you didn't do this yet. Something that we haven't even done. Because just like our rate of killing each other is exponentially higher than the cops killing us, whites are too, same way. They're killing each other way more than cops are killing them. And like they love to say, the more white people you kill by cops. So that means more white people have to be killing more white people. Now, with that being said, I think you have to look at the part that black people are not killing each other for existing. The police are killing black people simply for existing. You are a black man, that animosity, like not every cop, sure, not every cop, but there are racist cops that are killing people. They don't like black men. Like I might kill you over what, money or a drug or whatever. I think our environment, <laughs> So our environments breed these these behaviors and acts because we are the resources aren't there and shit like that, whatever. So I think that's also a part of it. 
I big disagree. Okay. I big disagree <laughs> because I know for a fact as a light skinned black male, I'm not talked to and treated the same way in the hood as, as black men treat other black males. I've had personal experiences. People talk to you a certain way if they feel that you're in proximity to whiteness. They talk to you a certain way if they feel that you're in proximity to wealth. Uh, and they, they're not holding a consistent value for black life across the board. And, 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 to the, and to the notion about black on black crime, I understand, I believe it was Nixon or was it Reagan who coined the term? I don't know, but uh, in sociological studies, um, and in sociological studies, uh, people use black on black crime. I've read white on white crime. I've read Hispanic on Hispanic crime because when you're talking about murders interracially, you have to use spe specific identifiers. And at the end of the day, my the the rate like the chances of me dying is higher than higher being killed by a black male than it is any other race. I mean that's just the data, and right. I mean we can look in the city of Philadelphia and see that. So my question then becomes, if innocent black people are subject to being killed at a high rate by other people in the hood, and we don't have to call it black on black, we call it hood on hood. But if black people are dying by their own people at a faster rate, innocent black folk even at that as well, black folk in general, it's like, why, why, I don't, I don't know why that gets brushed off uh, so much and and white people also kill white folk there's data on how much they kill each other uh and the data says it's it's five times less than the way we kill ourselves and and that stems from slavery how we view each other how we view our lives right. we do not have a high regard for our lives the way that we should be you know i look at gentrifying areas the petty crimes that white pe white people deal with is maybe having their amazon package stolen having the flowers on their uh their house, you know, stolen. Uh, but black folk, it's like, they, they see what you got. You set a TV out, they want to run in because they see you as being a person that doesn't have advocacy and is in this the same boat as them where they feel they can target. I, that's a real issue, but we right. don't really yeah. talk about it. Yeah, but I, I think it's, I would still say the reason why people prioritize it in a different way, I suppose, is because Again, like we all agree, well, we, we all know that the, the argument is that no, if I pay you, you shouldn't be killing me. And I do agree that it's a systematic thing of like, no, like keep black people down. That's why yeah. the, the jail raids, the sentences, the, the, poli the harsh treatment when you get taken in or I get, I'm, I'm, I get arrested more, all that type of shit and I get killed. It's a lot of, it's a, a bunch of moving parts of the system that's against black people in a sense with that. Mm -hmm. I feel like with black crime or I suppose, I think we have to understand or account for, like you said, slavery. So the 400 years of trauma that now we inhibit it and now we project towards each other or whoever's around us in a sense, whatever. And then also the lack of resources and therefore our environments are so fucked up that niggas are, I think I spoke about this earlier about the, if you don't have a certain level of stability, you're acting from a standpoint of survival. So yeah. I'm just trying to get by and get here to serve a guard. And if I see that, I'm gonna take that shit. Not saying that's right, but I would like I like to imagine, I suppose, that if the economy is shifted around and resources are allocated to certain environments mm -hmm. that need it, that really need it, and have always needed it, and people in certain jobs are implemented, and people are able to feed themselves, wages are increased, and the economy just like gets shifted. No, yeah. People aren't just so scarce. That people wouldn't act, they wouldn't act the same. They wouldn't have to act the same. Like, I got a job. No, no, no. I, can, so I, can, yeah. I can provide for myself. I'm good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree a thousand percent on on the the general crime thing. And I know for a fact that uh, white people and, and privileged people in general um, have their crime overlooked uh, mm -hmm. in ways that black folk don't. However, my stance on murder specifically is that whether you're poor or not, mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't be murdering people. Of course. Um, you shouldn't be murdering, murdering people and certainly not you know, running in someone's house with a loaded gun with the intent to murder if you have to and you ran in their home. Mm -hmm. so, and, so crime is gonna be there, but my biggest issue right now with the black community is the murders because innocent people are being shot. You have people who are shooting into block parties with children and women and men. And, um, <laughs> 
like 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 I feel like I feel like the Nets just senseless. It's just like those are weaker links, and it's and and another thing I think that people don't really um you gotta look at something like this too. Motherfuckers who could do that, like they really are outliers. Like it might not feel like it, but they really like because I know a lot of motherfuckers from the hood who, who claim they just stay that they that in the third break. They not shooting at no crowds. They are scared that they might they might be scared to death to shoot at one person. So they exactly. definitely not shooting to a crowd. And a person like that is an outlier. You see what I'm saying? So you can't see an event like that and kind of be like, that's the type of shit people do though. You know what I mean? And another thing I wanted to touch on besides that, because I do that's that's a crazy thing that people do. I think that's out of fucking pocket. That should never be an instance, but it is because outliers exist. Mm-hmm. Another thing I felt was that. You write the the that black cause like you pushing for this black thing isn't the same like standard across the board with the whole colorism realm the whole you know spectrum, but I do think in a lot of cases sometimes if you look at a motherfucker with white skin or whatever it usually isn't about them only being light skin it's about something else that they have. For instance, you might have had a family, a dad, you had game, you had access to a foundation, and a motherfucker might have seen you with light skin, but they also seen you had all that and was like, fuck him. He got what I can't, I could never have. He got dad, he got wealth, he got this, he got something I could never have. And they might have hated you for that and just slapped you being light skin on the two because it was easy to make fun of. You see mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Oh, so yeah. It wasn't about you being light skin. It's about what you had as another black person, and they didn't. And that comes from that survival mindset. So mm-hmm. these these and things are not, trauma. It's trauma. So these things are not as black and white as we would like to feel, you know, and it's wrong. But at the end of the day, you got to think about how do we end up in this situation? How do we get zoned into these situations? How do we get redlined into these situations? How do we yeah. get declined into these situations, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of different factors, and you can't just put on a motherfucker trying to survive him. You gotta put it on, people place them in a cage, and now he ripping the bars off with his teeth. Oh no, listen, I agree 1,000% and in, in, in the predicaments, and the systematic predicaments oh, that, that push for us to be there. I, I just like, my question, my question is just really, mm-hmm. are, are there some things that we can't come back from? Like is is uh like the outliers that we talk about, you know, the people who shoot in crowds or the people who um like yeah. on our way to liberation, what are we gonna deem acceptable in the movement moving forward versus what we aren't? And how are we gonna deal with that, you know, determining who needs to be purged out of the community, uh, versus who is gonna move forward because, you know, it's gonna be hard if we have a lot of internal chaos. And yeah, and I also like your point. You brought up the uh, the Hannibal and all that stuff because I agree. Like, with that perspective, you know, a lot we we can a lot of people understand that it's easier for something to crumble from the inside. And so, mm-hmm. all that being said, how can something truly, in a sense, progress and move forward if there's always internal chaos? So I can. With that being said, I can maybe get the point of like shit has to shit maybe should be fixed here before we can try to get there if like you know yeah 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 and, and, and i yeah and I, and I understand that no one group is perfect no yeah, one is going to be problem free i just i just want us to establish a baseline of what is acceptable at least at the bare minimum our lives you know i think a, i think and i think a big thing too is that doing during all this shit that happened over time a lot of leaders were washed out, jailed, or whatever, and a lot of other people never stepped up to be leaders. So a lot right. of the rules, a lot of the rules went out the window. You see what I'm saying? Like, like a motherfucker came shooting a crowd and would have got away with that a while ago when the OGs was around. They would have been out of here. You see what I'm saying? And and somebody would probably been apologizing to their family on his behalf. You see what I'm saying? And like, and then it's like rules like this. Like motherfucker will call. A business owner or a snitch for calling the cops, but mm-hmm. how you calling a civilian a snitch? That man's a civilian. He didn't make a pact to be a street dude. So I think mm-hmm. when we put, we gotta get the leaders back in place. We gotta mm-hmm. get the rules back in place, and then we can mobilize on that. Like you breaking these rules, you going against this. Like you need, then you get the fuck out of here. You need to be mm-hmm. heard. But 
I think people need that chance to be put on the right path too. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not enough leaders to put these people on the right path. Like for instance, a lot of people thought Lalo was corny at first, but he changed a lot of these little young boys' lives just being on the internet, giving them the rules. Mm-hmm. Just giving them the rules. And it's like, if we could get more of that, with your vision, it could come into fruition. Mm-hmm. That's one thing so I know. That's one thing I noticed. Um, I, I watched The Sopranos for the first time all the way through, maybe a year or two ago. And I was like, well, of course, you know, these niggas racist. They were talking. They hit a black girl, that shit, whatever. I was like, wow, like, this is how it's supposed to go, though. Like, the rules and codes of conduct. Like, these niggas were legit businessmen and had all types. It was just regular people that was doing, putting in work and doing crime when need to. It, it, it wasn't, it was, that, and that's what the most, that was one of the most fascinating things about the show, too. Like, these niggas were cold blooded killers. If I kill you, it's a wrap. It's going to go no matter what. But I don't want to. Like, right. it's, it's like a last case scenario. I don't really want what to do, but if I do it, no thought about it. But it was like, they had businesses. It was like this, we, we need to mm-hmm. talk. We need to have several talks before we even get to an escalated point, or whatever. And it was a mm-hmm. system in place above crime. It was all crime, but it's like, if you don't got rules, there's going to be a bunch of chaos going around for no fucking reason. Senseless shit. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah, know I feel- crazy about that? I feel like a lot of these young boys, they want a name so bad, they want to be remembered so bad, they don't care how they remember. Mm-hmm. So they would talk, like they probably know about a couple of people who put a lot of work in who are rotten until a new jail won't be built on top of them. <laughs> but for whatever reason, their blocks still talk about these people. Right. And they don't talk about the motherfucker who owned 12 houses that might have came from that block. Still so own it too. Still own the houses. <laughs> Still own them. So that's the way they see how to get a name. And they like, fuck whatever rules behind it, I'm going to get my name. And they f- running wild trying to do that. And nobody pulling them to the side like, no, nah, that's not how you do it. That's how you do it. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing. Wanting to be remembered for the wrong shit, though. But you don't care as long as you remember. It's like, shit is crazy, right? Yeah. What you want to say, Jake? No, I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, we need more leaders. I know there's things I got to step up on. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm making plans on that. But definitely, we need more leaders. I know me. I, uh, I, I never said earlier, because you spoke on what your path, like me, Jake spoke a little bit with his path. I know me, like, I, I look at it like myself. I said, I'm not, I don't put as much pressure on myself in regards to like my creative pursuits, but you know, they're still in motion. But I know I want the stocks to lead to certain other assets, like whether it's vending machines or real estate or whatever, and then compound those things to a certain level. So then I feel like I will look forward to, also me, me first, I will look at myself like I'm a lead by example type guy. I'm not like a super rah rah and all that type of shit, whatever. But it's like, like I said, I feel these type of conversations. That's why I like to have them every now and then. Are just example enough. Like no, like let's say, real. You said you like to embody certain things, so to so to inspire other people beneath you, whatever. You said you thought Wallow was a great example. So I feel like these conversations alone is what I feel are just needed and can help someone, whether older, or young, but no. And I just feel besides someone hearing, I feel it's good for the ecosystem. So no, no, like this why I feel this why I feel needs to happen more, so I'm gonna just do it type thing. Mm-hmm. Regardless if you heard it or not, I put it out in the atmosphere so it can circulate in some capacity or whatever. And I feel like I look forward to doing certain things like that, just leading by example to embody certain things, represent certain things. It's like, no, we need more of this type of shit, whether you see it or not, whether you recognize it or not, I'm doing it though. And I know one thing I always I want to do eventually that I am gonna do, I feel like niggas build courts every day, niggas put up rims every day, whatever, all that type of shit. But I know I want to do like a, I always say like a um, YMCA for the arts per se. Like something mm-hmm. where niggas go and just, I don't know if I'd be interested in playing the piano. Well, you can play a piano right here. Let's see if someone could teach you that shit. I don't know if I want to tap dance. You can tap dance right here, nigga. I don't know if I want to rap. Man, I thought I wanted to rap, but I'm ass. Well, you can learn how to make a beat right here or do sound yeah. right here. Or you can, yeah, you can do some, you can do lights at a play, just a whole big ass space where it's just, no, you can, it could be like an app school program where you could just be just in here just messing around with shit and just figuring out whatever. You can have classes, like an LA fitness. I feel mm-hmm. shit like that. Again, it just needed yeah. and you can see it and you can go here and do that wherever. And it's like. I think it's so crazy that like us as a people, like so many people have the same direction and ideas and want to bring that same shit because 
It's probably from all of us sharing the same fucking trauma and just lack of resources, bro. Like, like what you just said, like, that's another thing, like, I look forward to doing. Like, it's, it's buildings in my neighborhood, like, old schools that close down. I'm like, man, I could use this school. We could put, we could put that stuff in there. Like, we could put programs and We could teach kids how to program in here. We could teach kids music in here. We could teach all these things. We had financial we literacy had class kids. in middle school. Like, yeah. <laughs> things that they cut the budgets for to fund the goddamn police with shit that these kids really needed where you wouldn't need this much money to police our communities if you would invest in our communities. Right. Mm -hmm. But now we have to invest. Mm -hmm. right. But mm -hmm. I will, uh, get, um, but the sign out though, your guys want to drop any information people to find you at or anything you want to promote, anything like that? We got it. Uh, yeah, uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter and IG. It's uh, the letter J, Peck, P-H-L. I think that's, that's yeah, J, Peck, P-H-L. And uh, I love the work that you're doing, Q. Um, it was great uh, meeting you, Ro. Uh, hearing your story is phenomenal. Uh, you know, we need more black men and, and women, but mostly black men in STEM. You know, engineering is one of those fields where it's like it's lucrative. It's it's uh, so it's resourceful. So you know, it was great hearing your story. It's true, right. man. Real estate is definitely inspiration. Seeing where we, we work from and, and the path we took. You know what I mean? Just knowing that that's a, a similar path I want to take and see what somebody else do it and get there. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. cool to see. Thanks, man. Yep. So shout out to y'all. Appreciate that. Um, again, if you listened this far, if you didn't think it was too ass or too barn or too trash or whatever, subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen to shit. Listen to past episodes. They've been on shit before. Um, and also listen to, uh, I don't put together a compilation album, bring an artist together in the city, search it right on Q Live. One word. Wow. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, Q U E right on Q Live. An album's called We Are Live. Subscribe, listen anywhere. We out. Ryan Q Live. Talk.